Dun, dun, dun. Hi guys. I'm in the course, I like that. That's all right. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, basically, my name's Graham Budd, as uh, we were introduced there, um, for the South West Neighbourhood in Edinburgh, working for the City of Edinburgh Council, and I'm a Partnership Development Officer, which is a really nice way of saying dog's body. Um, basically, I work with lots of communities, uh, engaging them in the, in the work that we do on an everyday basis, um, and all of their jobs as deemed appropriate by my line manager, which seems to take up 90% of it some days. And Sati? Um, I'm Sati, I work in the West Neighbourhood team, but also the community planning team for the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, so I work in a more city-wide providing strategic support. I love that phrase, it's great. No one knows what I do. I'm the thinking team. <laughs> so um, I also manage the West Neighbourhood Twitter account, so I'm from the West Neighbourhood team. Okay, you want to push your buttons this time? Oh. Yeah. Okay, new technology. Um, just as a wee demonstration in terms of what, what kind of new technology and how technology kind of advances. This is an advert for 1990. There's no sound, I've taken the sound off just now. Um, but this is a marvellous invention which may become popular anytime soon. It's called the mobile telephone. Um, as you can see, it's good for carrying, it's also good for hand to hand combat. Um, this particular model was about $4,000 when it first came out. Um, and that's why there's like shots of them on a boat because I think only a certain audience could really afford to do this and use it. To use it. Um, I, I, when new technology comes along, it's always, there's always an interesting kind of curve. Oh, there we go. Uh, in terms of how things are taken up and adopted. Um, here's some quotes uh, from, from various people making predictions about the future. Uh, the first one, everything that can be invented has been invented. And that was, of course, uh, 1899 at the US Patents Office. So that was quite a while ago, and I think that person's probably been proved wrong. Um, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Um, and that was uh, one of the, basically, the founders of Warner Brother Pictures in 1927. Um, luckily, he was incorrect, um, and has done quite well of it ever since, I think. Um, and there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Now that was only 1977, uh, and that was basically the present founder of the company Digital, which has now been bought up by Compaq. Quiz time. You've already had sweets, this is a chance to win kudos. <laughs> and the question is, how many adults in the UK own a mobile phone? In percentage Percentage, we'll go for percentage. 95. 95%. 96%. 96%. 67%. The, the correct answer is 92% of adults, so you know, you're all about the right, the right, right. we're about a bit too low there, but yeah, close enough. 27% of which own a smartphone and 47% of teenagers, which is a kind of separate one, own uh, a smartphone as well. Um, social media today, 50% of adults, of UK adults, use it at home, that's from Ofcom. Um, in Edinburgh, there is a, which is basically our audience in Edinburgh, um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of active Facebook users. There's actually a lot more active accounts come up than that, but I'm taking into account the fact there's loads of pages as well, so I've dropped it down. I think the real figure last time I checked was actually near 450,000, to be honest. 6.5% um, of Edinburghers, I've been burgers, um, use Twitter and 5% cycle to work. I like this one because it kind of, it, it kind of shows it in real kind of terms because it's, it's kind of an online thing. You're never quite sure how it actually works out. Uh, and less than 10% read the evening news. The evening news, does anyone know what the evening news are? What it is, yeah. sorry. Everyone pretty much? Yeah, the kind of tabloid paper in Edinburgh. Um, even, evening news is the one that will always hit us from a comms point of view in terms of if something goes in the evening news, our senior managers are always quite quick to kind of jump up and try and defend it. And it's the ones that we look at as pretty much kind of the voice of the common man in Edinburgh. Um, however, their readership has been plummeting over the last few years. Um, I think less than 10 years ago it was like 100,000 people were, uh, were, were reading it. Now you're looking at less than, I think it's about 33,000 average daily sub um, circulation. It is the same with all print media, but it's, it's good to know, look at the percentages in terms of this is starting to rise, this one's starting to fall. So it includes reading online? That's purely the print. That's the print circulation. The online was a bit different. The evening news were are actually really interesting in terms of the fact that they're, they didn't really have social media. They didn't have any kind of strategy. And I think one of their main downfalls was the fact that you could go on and look at it online for free. Um, I, I don't know what their, um, their advertising figures are like for online. That would be quite interesting to look at. Um, but they've actually employed someone now recently to start doing their social media. And they've, you can tell they've started taking their first steps into this. They've not been done pretty well because they've been, it's obviously someone's quite new to it because the way they've used hashtags has been not entirely correct. And there was one about trying to get people to report issues in, but they didn't check up the hashtag first. And it was actually a hashtag that someone was already using for a completely different, uh, um, for a different subject matter. But it got incorporated in there and they ended up getting loads of random tweets that didn't make any sense from across the world, I think it was, in fact. Um, in terms of the council social media, 
The big daddy of them all is the Edinburgh uh, Council account, which has got just short of 18,000 followers at the moment. I think it's the biggest one for a local authority in Scotland, but I may be wrong. Um, and there's also they've got the Faust Facebook page as well, which is just short of 2,000 fans or likers on that one. Uh, we don't really have much to do with these two pages, I'll, I'll tell you now, um, just because they're basically corporately controlled. Um, they're generally broadcast as well. There's not a huge amount of interaction in these ones. Um, Ed and Travel is one that I'll come on to in a minute. Ed and Travel is the brainchild of a man named uh, John Mackay, and that's a brilliant account, I'll tell you that in a bit. And they've got just short of 11,000 followers. In fact, probably, I did this a few days ago, they might actually be at 11,000 now. The neighbourhood accounts, there are six neighbourhoods in the City of Edinburgh Council's area. Um, they each have a social media account or two. Um, we've got Facebook and Twitter. West, which is one Saturday's neighbourhood, have Twitter at the moment and maybe looking at getting Facebook later on. Um, we basically, ours is a lot about our, our area, what we're trying to do is get interaction and we're very discussive on it. We you know, have a lot of back and forth. It's definitely not a broadcast only um, channel. Um, and we've got a lot smaller area to cover, which is why our followers are smaller, but you know, we're, we're perfectly formed and it's all thriller, uh, no filler, as I've said before, I think. We use it for a number of reasons, the council as a whole. I think there's almost, there's probably about 50 odd accounts now, there's definitely in the late 40s in terms of the number of social media accounts that the Edinburgh Council has got. We've got a Facebook page for every library, we've got main library pages, we've got Twitter as well. The main reason we use these pages is for consulting with our residents, reporting issues with services and promoting events and service changes. The big broadcast accounts, that's essentially their main remit. These two here are more in our kind of, um, our kind of uh, idiom, if you like, for our neighbourhood accounts. This is, uh, I'm talk a little bit now about Ed and Travel, which uh, I would love to say that I came up with the idea for it. It's brilliant. I'd love to take credit for it. It's one of the ideas that's so simple and it's beautiful and it's amazing and it's not mine, uh, unfortunately. It was launched in May 2010, originally to provide accurate and relevant information on traffic delays and to pre-publicise any kind of issues. Um, the idea essentially was broadcast based, to tell people what was happening in the city, where the roadworks were going to be, what sort of areas they should avoid, that sort of thing. It's followed by over 9,000 people at the moment. However, it's become, it's developed um, through, the, through the, the gentleman, Mr. Mackay. He's basically come up with using crowdsourcing using that hashtag, Ed and Travel. Does anyone, does everyone know what crowdsourcing is? No. Um, I think the example I gave in the previous um, West session, what's that? Restaurants. Restaurants, yeah, that was it. Basically, it's like me saying in a room full of crowded people, I'm going to go for lunch today near this hotel. Can anyone recommend a good restaurant? And seeing what, what, what things you get back. Basically, Ed and Travel are based in the Nerve Centre, which is a, a traffic control room which has loads of cameras on the arterial routes. John's also got access to all the pre-planned uh, roadworks. So he's got a big database here of what the roadworks should be doing, and he can see in his maps the main arterial routes in Edinburgh. However, there's loads of routes he can't see that are bus routes and all the rest of it. So you can't be everywhere, you just can't be. So the idea is basically people can use this in their text of their tweet. It'll be seen by other users out of, out, out of hours for a start if John's not in the, in the office to retweet it. But also he can take that information and fire it out to his guys as well, er, his followers as well. So it's basically a way of getting the public, the commuters themselves, to actually give each other and share each other information about the traffic. It's especially good because a lot of smartphone users are on buses. So they're travelling up and down these roads. They're not driving, but they can share that information with uh, other bus users, other commuters as well. Um, and if you're about to leave, leave the house, it's always good to have a wee look at Ed and Travel before you do so in Edinburgh, because that'll tell you what's happening. This is the best tweet I ever sent, or the biggest tweet I ever sent. July the 4th, 2012. It was, uh, this was one of the days when I was absolutely chucking it down. And this was the day that I decided to go pick up my brand new bicycle. Uh, so I picked up my brand new bicycle and I went home and got absolutely drenched. And I got to this street, um, basically I live up the top of this hill here. This is quite a main route, this is next to Holyrood. Um, the Parliament's down here, the Holyrood Palace is there, and there's main buses that come up and down here. Now this, this water was, as you can see, up to the bottom of those lights for that car. These, these cones were actually floating around the middle of it, so it was going to be a major traffic problem. And traffic was backing up right the way through the park as well. So I was like, oh brilliant, I've been waiting for this excuse to do it at any time now. So I took a photo and I said, you know, road completely flooded under the railway bridge at Holyrood, Edinburgh Travel. Basically to let people know what was going on. And the result was, 54 people retweeted it to their followers. More than 33,000 people actually saw that tweet within the space of a couple of hours. Uh, loading buses saw it, they fired it out through their account. They were able to, I mean, because their 35 goes down that route, so they were able to make them kind of put some things out about there'll be, there'll be a delay to the 35, take any necessary action there. STV Local put it out as well, and the Evening News as well, who just started using their account, put it out as well. I've got about 400 people following me, and in the space of a few hours, 
but 30,000 30, people saw that tweet, saw that information, which is pretty impressive. And 50 new people began following the Eden Travel account in the space of a couple of hours. Stopping complaints before they happen. This is one of the things that we're not as good at as I'd like, and I'd like to do more, but it's very much a resource issue. But it's one that Twitter's brilliant at. A gentleman in the centre of town basically fired out a tweet saying, my advice, don't pay Edinburgh Council tax online. The payment failed and we got a penalty charge for it. Um, he didn't at any point mention any of the council accounts. So this is not coming directly to us. This is him just out into the ether, just saying he's not happy with this service. And if you think about that, that's generally what happens with most services. If someone gets a bad service in a restaurant, I generally won't complain. I will go away and I will moan about it to my friends that that was a really bad restaurant or I'll tell anyone that listened how bad it was but I will not say boo to a ghost in terms of telling them. However, someone in the office was basically looking for things that were mentioned in Edinburgh Council, they saw it, they did some work behind the scenes, they contacted the person and they were able to rectify the issue. So this guy, without even actually directly contacting him, had our issue turned round, had his, fr had his frown turned upside down, so he became Mr Happy and basically fired out saying kudos to the City of Edinburgh Council for sorting out the issue I tweeted about yesterday within 24 hours. He's blogged about it, he's done numerous things about it, and he's become an ambassador for us now. Whereas before, essentially, he would have been in the background, you know, throwing rocks or throwing spears. <coughs> Making our services more visible and humanising them. We've done a lot of work with this. And this is especially something that we do in the neighbourhoods very well, I think. Wherever you live, there'll be someone who'll look after the services and deliver the services in your neighbourhood. Um, so uh, bins, roads, uh, parks, litter, you name it, someone's out there doing, doing the work. But as we're sitting here, office hours, the chance of you seeing them when they're working office hours is remote, unless you're standing at your window, looking out like that, waiting for them to go past, and you know what they're up to. This was a way of saying, this is the sort of things that are going on in the neighbourhood, in your local area, now. Um, and it was also a way of humanising them and saying, rather than it's the council doing this, this is Kevin. Kevin from Rhodes is doing an inspection of the area. He's making notes of all the bollards and all things that are incorrect, and he's listing them. And he's actively saying to you, is there any issues that you wanted to send us? Send us with them, and we'll deal with them. Diana's an environmental warden. Diana basically goes around finding people for dog fouling. One of the biggest things we always get is dog fouling. People hate dog fouling because it's mess, and it's everywhere, and it's what's happening with it, and nothing ever happens with it, and all you see is the poo. You never see any other issues with it. Um, but these guys are out dealing with it constantly. They're out at the weekends as well. You know, they're, they're, they're working seven days a week, pretty much. Um, so what we did with Diana, which is especially a good example, Diana had never tweeted before. She didn't know what Twitter was. This was about a year or so ago. Um, but they were sick and tired of basically getting, basically having to turn to people and find people and getting told, we never see the wardens out, they're never there. Where are they? What are they doing? What are you doing about this dog filing issue? So we got, uh, basically spoke to Diana and to told her a lot about um, Twitter and how you could use it. No one else in the office wanted to touch Twitter at this point. It was all about, this is a way for people to beat us with sticks. People will come and say bad things to us. They'll, you know, people don't like us, this is a bad thing. Diana had never used a, 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 a Twitter before at all. And what we did is we set her up with a phone, she used her own phone, and we got her out there tweeting stuff. And rather than just saying, being able to say, the wardens are in Gorgie and Dalry today looking for dog fowlers, it was Diana was in Gorgie and Dalry today doing a patrol. So basically got to fire things out like, hi, my name's Diana, I'm the senior warden in Southwest. I'll be tweeting today while out and about. Normally, if we'd said the, gor the, the wardens are out in, in Gorgie and Dalry, we'd have got some folks saying, oh, there's dog fowling here, it's really bad, you're not doing a good job. Whereas this time, we got folks saying, hi, Diana, looking forward to your walkabout. I mean, this is someone who's out looking for dog poo, essentially. You know, it's not really, it's not a happy, fluffy story. It's not like the libraries or anything else. But people were actively engaging in this. And we were able to anonymise the stuff, and just enough to give people kind of privacy. I mean, there's one here. Just visited a shop in Gorgie Road to ask that banner be taken down as it's distracting divers, uh, drivers. Thanks to the shopkeeper for taking it down, immediately smells all around. Doesn't tell who put the banner up. Doesn't say anything else. We got a lot of tweets asking us what was on the banner. Um, but that was about it. But people were actively engaged in this. Um, it went really well. Um, I deliberately didn't promote this because it was the first time we'd ever done this. And I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, was this going to fall on its face? Were people really going to care? Who knows? You know what I mean? And, you know, politically, it's going to be a bit sensitive. Without promoting it, just short of 12,000 people um, could have seen, in theory, one of those tweets. That's the number of accounts we reached with that. STV posted two articles on it. Uh, the first one was that we'd done it and how great it was. The second one, they wanted to come and interview us, and we did a big chat with them about how we'd done this and how successful it was, and we had a, a big bit of banter, and they actually basically let us write the article, to be honest. We got 22 new followers on that one day from that, and uh, links that we sent out, which essentially was uh, links to how you can report dog fouling and what the wardens do, got like 19 people clicked on that link. 
We also got, um, we actually had some online su or some offline ex success as well in terms of people that saw tweets that didn't tweet back. They actually phoned the wardens, two people phoned, I think, or one phoned and one emailed to basically say that one of the issues they'd raised, they believed this was the person that had done it. Um, again, I think it was dog fouling, and that resulted in a fixed penalty. And we were able to put out the next day, thanks very much to the people who came forward to give us information for on the issue with, I think it was Wheatfield Road. I think one fixed penalty was issued to a gentleman who was caught during the day sort of thing. So big success. And these guys didn't even reply to us online. Um, and the, one of the local elected members who's very into his online stuff, um, he basically did a big blog post about how he thought it was a really good thing. Um, and then basically he became leader of the council uh, during the election as well. So, uh, and now we're doing a lot more live tweeting and things with him, which is cool. On a daily basis, though, we're not doing the kind of live tweets things. Basically, we're we're basically responding to a lot of issues, and um, we're trying to keep a bit of personality in it. You'll see that one's got a little G at the end of it. Uh, when I respond to things, it's G. When Sarah responds to something, it's S. And when Kerry responds to something, it's it's K. So you're basically still giving that personality that people know it's a person at the end of the at the end of the day. And um, this one was about lights. Basically, firing this thing saying. Uh, Stenhouse Place East Park has become a stage for illegal garbage in the past week. Some lights are are highly needed there. So basically, go, okay, I'll pass this to our team and see what could be done. Or this, is it the street lights that are out? Um, no, they're working, but the park is none and it's very creepy at night. The perfect setting for bad things to happen. Uh, and then it's basically, okay, I'll pass it to our parks officer and report back, thanks. Uh, it so happened that a uh, parks officer also passed it to our environment wardens who went out there and actually banged into uh, Boyana as she was coming out of her house after sending us these. Um, so right away, she's seeing the fact that she's tweeted the office and you've got um, uh, one of our other wardens, Kat, there inspecting the situation. Just chatted with one of your lovely colleagues in the park. It was nice seeing you all doing something. Thanks. You know, so I was able to give that back to the officer for a start as a compliment to say, you know, you got some good feedback. And then later on, a few weeks later, I was able to go back to Bozanda and basically say, update on the lighting. Our parks officer is going to get costings for lighting for here and add it to our proposed projects. And she's delighted because she's seen it from start to beginning. She raised something. We sent someone out to check it out. And then ultimately, we're looking to actually spend a bit of money in fixing the issue. We've done a number of other projects as well. A citywide campaign to promote spring cleans. Uh, it's called Edding Clean. Basically, over the course of a month or so, we, we did loads of different uh, live tweets and we did loads of campaigns. We put posters out using a hashtag and really blitzed the place, trying to encourage the kind of dig for victory sort of community spirit of people getting involved with spring cleaning. Um, that was the only thing that we'd really done differently um, from the spring clean, which is an annual thing. And we increased the number of spring cleans that, were, that, took, part, uh, that took place in Edinburgh sorry, uh, by about a third. I got the figures back yesterday for that one. Um, we also followed the Olympic Torch live through Edinburgh, able to kind of showcase some of the kind of services that we're doing it by handing it over, and we got a lot of good positive responses from there. That's one that kind of, is it work, is it not work? You know, that's a bit of a tricky one for us, but it, it got us a lot of positive feedback and really started to engage people in the account. We also done a number of live Q&A sessions with the leader of the council and various police inspectors, which again is a brilliant way of people able to, to speak to someone online instantly and have their questions answered. And it's not um, the customer service person, it's the person who's leading up that service. And if there's anything that's going to kind of hopefully instill trust and uh, transparency and, and, and ownership, then it's something like that where you can talk to the CEO or you can talk to the, 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 to the, the man in charge. We've also done Twitter 24 as well, which is hours of interacting with the council services uh, and facilities, which 24 hours of interacting with council services and facilities sounds like a horrible thing, but it was, it was really good. And it was, again, another way for people to, to, to showcase and, and find out what was happening in their council and what we actually do on a daily basis. Um, this is when I'm trying to head off some of the negative comments or some of the kind of questions that people get when they get all doom and gloom at the end of these things. If we start using social media, the world will end because, number one, people will say bad things about us they're already saying bad things about you, they're, it's out there. This is the chance for you to address those um, and for you to really get involved. And to be honest, the bad things are not always bad, they're just critical because someone's not happy, because the communication is not good or because they don't understand the process. And um, we've had a number of big accounts, and um, we've had another big, number of big accounts that uh, for cycling in Edinburgh that basically came in when we first started online were hammering us because things weren't getting done and what was happening with cycling and you're not doing this. And we're able to say to them, certainly we'll do that for you, this is the process, this is how you get involved. And they're like, oh, thanks. And it goes from a total confrontational thing to, oh, that, this is actually quite good. And these large accounts, which are followed by several thousand people, are now our ambassadors. And when someone else doesn't tweet us directly about an issue that we can have some kind of um, impact on when it involves cycling, they'll actually tweet them and mention us and say, these are the guys you want to speak to. These guys can sort it out for you. And it's not us who's being the, the ambassador. We're, it's not us saying, oh, we're great at this. We're going to do something. This is someone independent who's saying, these guys are really good. You should listen to these guys. Um, 
people will ask us questions we can't answer right away. That was the same with the Boyander uh, comment. We get those all the time. I mean, if you go to a public meeting, people will ask you questions. People will say, what is the NHS going to do about world hunger? And you can't answer that. Uh, but you can say, honestly, I don't know. I'll find out. I'll come back to you. Have you got an email address or anything else? People expect us to be in 24 hours. No, it's not an emergency service. We make that quite clear in our kind of biogs that are on there. But also the fact that most folk generally, the, the people are, people want to be responded to within a, within a day or so. But it's not that they expect to you right this second to run out there and fix their problem. Our complaints guys, uh, or our different teams, their big fear was the fact that we launched Twitter, that I'd come to them and say, someone's just tweeted us about an issue. We have to drop everything you're doing, and every, uh, you know, every phone call you've had, every email you've received, that doesn't matter. I need you to go out there and build a new skate park. I need to do it now so I can respond to this person on Twitter. That's not the case. It's put through the normal complaints process, the normal channels that we normally use. Staff will say bad things. Again, it's the same as sending a member of staff out to a public meeting. If they're going to say something bad, they'll say something bad. Um, it's generally more misguided. To be honest, my rules are, you know, stop, think, breathe, tweet. If you do it in that way, then generally you're all right. There's a number of things I've put in and halfway through I've gone, Maybe not. Um, you've also got policies in place, things like your email policies, your IT policies, stuff which should take care of that anyway. We don't have enough time to do this. This is all feeding into our normal processes. And if you can monitor it, hopefully what you'll see as well in terms of channel shift is that people will, rather than complain through one medium, they'll go to this medium and ask you a question. Or you'll actually see, as we've had in some, um, in some instances, people, the complaints will actually reduce as soon as you start broadcasting a message and telling people the correct channels to use. We had that with, uh, we had an issue with grass cutting. People were uh, hammering us for, for grass cutting, saying, We've not, you've not cut the grass in my park, you've not cut the grass in my park, because obviously all you can see is your own park, you can't see everyone else's park. We were getting loads of complaints through. We basically put a web page together saying, look guys, hands, hands up, we've made a mistake on this one, we're, we're trying to rectify it, bear with us please. We fired it out, and the number of emails complaints dropped off dramatically. Um, so in many ways it kind of saved this time. And what we do is interesting. We send out loads of amazing stuff every week and it sounds brilliant and you're like, this is going to be brilliant, people are going to adore this and guaranteed the one innocuous little thing you send out is the one that people love. We've got roads guys that cover a quarter of the network of the roads network of Edinburgh, right? We maintain that. So that's, that's potholes, you know, signage, you know, benches, you name it, it's resurfacing work, you know, loads of amazing stuff. We send out tweets about this all the time, and either they're well received and people are interested in it. The one that everyone absolutely loves, though, and everyone goes nuts for it, is dropped curbs. And, and it's basically because people are able to identify what dropped curbs they've asked to put in. So if people tweet, oh, that's my dropped curb, that one, you know, that one in Stenhouse, and you're like, brilliant, you know what I mean? It's great, but that's the one they really drop because it's a small thing that they've had some kind of influence on. So what you do isn't interesting. It's, it might not be interesting to you because you're doing it, but ultimately other people might find it absolutely fascinating. Thanks for listening, and just to have to ask you any questions, and if you push the button again. Da -da -da. There we go. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of our accounts there. So what barriers did you face trying to get your staff engaged in change? <coughs> Uh, bit, a lot of fear. We've got none of our managers above kind of our level really use social media. So the only time they hear anything about Twitter is you know footballer sends racist tweet. You know someone does something bad, uh, and it was because they don't use it, they don't really see the value in it. So you have to kind of they kind of go and it's just going to be you and a couple of your mates sitting in a darkened room. How many people are actually using Twitter? So one of the big barriers was saying, right, this is, this is how many people are using this for a start. This is a, it's a legitimate media. As I said, looking at the evening news is about 10%. This is about 5%. So it's not quite that yet. But if you understand that this is an important media, then surely this must have some importance as well. Um, the next one then was kind of looking at it and saying, right, well, how can we actually get staff involved? You know, what, what are the limits of the media and what will they do? I mean, originally, none of our teams were like, no, no, we don't, we're not doing this. We're not getting involved. Basically, by concentrating on the environment and wardens and by getting someone who was keen to do it, Showing them doing it successfully, very publicly successful, getting a lot of good feedback from it, and being able to crunch the numbers and actually saying, look, this is how many people got engaged, this is how many people um, followed it, how many people retweeted it. That was brilliant. That was a huge thing for us, because we were able to take that to everyone and go, this is a success, and this is why I can show it's a success. And then all the other teams suddenly go, wait a minute, actually, we want to be the next ones to get involved with this now, and that totally changed. Um, we do have some kind of access issues in terms of uh, some devices sometimes, but most of that you can kind of be negated. The biggest ones we've got are the kind of, or we, we had, were kind of the attitudinal ones, I'd say. Um, and like you say, if you, can, if you can get that one success, if you can take that one step forward, then you find that after that everything else seems to fall in place, really.
frame, what, what's your sort of time frame from your learning curve to where you are now? How long has it taken you and your team to get to where you are now in terms of using social media? Uh, we started our account, we lost our account in September, um, not last year, the year before. And we started out, when originally we started out, it was, it was kind of broadcasting our web pages originally. And West were on Twitter for a little bit longer. Um, it's, taken, it's taken a bit of time to get to this extent. I'd, I'd say we're, st I don't think we're ever really finished with it. Uh, still be learning, I guess, but I'm just wondering, you know, where you are now, how many staff are just Yeah. Yeah. You get a bit more kind of like, well, we get a bit more freedom. Mm. But you remember, really a lot more stuff. Yeah. So you see corporate, we can do. Yeah. That kind of builds up your confidence, and then you know, and you kind of get to try stuff that no one else will do. So that kind of speeds up the process, but well, it's quite a bit. I, th I think it, it's 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 a, I think it's it's all about that first team. That's really where your timescale comes in. In terms of getting them set up, getting them doing things, taking little chances, and seeing what you can get away with, and really judging your audience. Um, and from then on, you can start taking a little bit of risks. But with the first time when you first start out, your your manager's like, I don't know what this is. I don't want you doing anything that I've not signed off. And you're like, right, I'm going to send this person out with a phone. It's very difficult for me to get everything that you that he's going to send me to be signed off before it goes out. That's really not going to happen. Um, so it's really about, I think, different time skills for different things. I think the wardens now are away and running. The roads guys are getting better, and I've done more live tweets with them. Um, but still housing haven't quite come board. So it's almost like one team at a time that you're doing this with. And because we work with a number of different services as well, you've got a different service manager for each one sort of thing. So everyone's got the things that they don't like and the things they do like. Um, it does take a while um, to really kind of embed it, though. So it's, it's about how long is a bit of a piece of string, really. Um, sorry, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yes, we're all using the same account at the moment because we've got... This is the thing. It's when you get to the point where we're getting quite successful, the neighbourhood accounts. Now you find you've got one team environment wardens who want to tweet all the time, and you're like, "That's that's great, guys," but it's not an environment warden account. It's not a community safety account. It's a it's a neighbourhood wide account. So then, we're, what we're doing at the moment is we're starting to set up like kind of timetables of when people are going to be be live tweeting or when people are going to do office stuff. They've got certain schedules anyway, like on Thursdays when the roads guys have their meeting, so they know what they're going to be doing for the next week or so on a Thursday. So you know Thursday's a day that they'll update their pages and they'll put content out as well. You know that the warden's busy days are probably more kind of Thursday, Friday, so Friday's probably a good day for you with them. Whereas what are the housing guys' rents on Monday, so maybe it's a good day for them on the Monday or Tuesday. And it's just working with them and seeing what's, 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 what's available for them. There is an argument, do you start splitting into accounts? So you've got Southwest Warden, Southwest Housings and all the rest of it. And like, I really don't think we're there yet. And I don't think, I think the nature, nature of the, the way we try and deliver services, which is kind of holistically in that area, we'd really rather that someone's following our account. And maybe they're only interested in the wardens, but they start hearing about the stuff we're doing with roads and go, actually, that's, that's quite interesting too. Um, yeah. Do you think you could reach over those? I mean, in terms of the amount of, I mean, thinking about the exchange head of that, first about the park, mm. which is great, but presumably you've only got capacity to have that sort of exchange with so many Twitter users. And at the moment, it's presumably it seems exponentially. Are you expecting it at some point to hit a sort of ceiling or level off? Or is it just going to keep going up in which case, at what point does it become unmanageable? Uh, I think. The, there's always been different things that have come in. I think I'm very the, the idea of channel shift. I'm a big kind of supporter of in terms of there used to be one PC in our office which you emailed, and there was one person who was in charge of email, um, and then basically everyone got their own email, email accounts and we rolled it out. Um, and now there's one two people in the office that are doing the Twitter, and in theory that will kind of get rolled out as well through a different system. Yeah, we've got I mean, we've got like a, a Southwest team mailbox, and it's a bucket email box which has got seven or different eight people um, accessing it. What I'm trying to do at the moment, or what we're trying to do at the moment, is basically try and quantify what we're doing, log in things the same way that the Scottish Air Ambulance uh, guys are doing, in fact almost exactly the same way, so that I can say, right, this, today we've had you know, 50 phone calls, we've had 20 emails, we've had 15 tweets, and, had the, and service requests that have come through there, so that we can start looking and going, right, well, as soon as the calls start dropping down, maybe these guys and the tweets start rising, we can start getting these guys to start answering some of that, because a lot of it's kind of customer service. I mean, I don't know anything about a lot of these services, I'll be honest. I basically, all I know is that I'm going to answer the person and say, thanks very much, you know, interrogate it as much as I can and then pass it on to a team. Um, I think it's about kind of moving your resources as much as anything else. I know that the planning, Kieran from planning has told me this as well, that they have a planning hotline and they have a Twitter account. 
And what they're finding is their tweets are going up and their calls are dropping right off to the point where they're, I think they're actually dropping their staff down on that one. Mm -hmm. But the, kind of, the, the trick then is to stay with the manager and say, right, this is somewhere we need staff. But so the, basically we need to, rather than just kind of get rid of this member of staff or put them on our duties, this is the way we want to shift them and we can really start doing some stuff. So I don't think, I don't know that we'll ever reach overload. I think the way that we manage our resources will change to, to, sit, to suit that hopefully. And then, we'll, then holograms will come into the mix and we'll have to change again and that's the way it'll always be to be honest. You can get oh no worries. Is anyone else got any other questions? Okay, in that case, uh, thanks for listening to us. I'll be putting things online anyway and Thank get you. home safe. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cool.